<laughs> Great, thank you. I'm Krista Miller. I'm the scientific director of the MedStar Health National Center for Human Factors and Healthcare, but I am representing a much larger project today that includes uh, multiple healthcare systems. So this is a project actually funded by the CDC, um, a two-year award, um, again, includes lots of different healthcare systems, but I think really the, the beauty of this project is a number of different features where we are engaging with the community but to look at the spread of COVID-19 in a number of different ways. So we have participants that uh, are participating in daily syndromic surveillance. So you can imagine folks that maybe are experiencing some symptoms, but don't rise to the level of requiring clinical care. We have participants um, that conduct monthly serology tests. Um, and so in that way, we're capturing participants that perhaps are asymptomatic. We have symptom and serology triggered virology data, and then we have linked electronic health record data. So in that third component, the EHR data, we're actually capturing patients that are hospitalized. So we're able to get asymptomatic all the way up to um, hospitalizations. There are a number of different sites. Um, I represent MedStar Health in the Mid-Atlantic, uh, but six sites that were funded by the CDC, MedStar Health and University of Maryland representing that Mid-Atlantic area, Wake Forest, who's leading this project, and Atrium Health, representing North Carolina. And then in the Deep South, University of Mississippi and Tulane. Uh, there was, um, at the same time, a project funded through the CARES Act for the state of North Carolina. So that includes Atrium Health and Wake Forest in both cohorts, and then other healthcare systems in the North Carolina area. Um, so again, really two key components here. The first is daily syndromic surveillance, and you can see some screenshots at the top. Every day, um, folks get a, um, a request to complete this daily status through their email or through a push notification on their smartphone. It asks questions like, do you consider yourself healthy? Are you experiencing any symptoms? Um, are you wearing a mask? Have you had any exposures? And then collecting information about test results for COVID. Um, we've also added information, of course, about vaccines and now specifically um, the flu vaccine as well. And then there's the monthly serology tests. So these are at home kits, uh, which we thought was pretty important during the pandemic to make sure that this could all be, you know, from the safety and comfort of one's home. Um, and those are blood spot, uh, kits that you you know conduct in your home and then and then mail back. So collectively here we're able to capture symptoms. We can look at social distancing and personal protective equipment, like masks, access to healthcare, and then more objective measures like prevalence of antibodies and also vaccine related outcomes. We have more than sixty thousand uh, people that are participating in this study. Obviously around the healthcare systems that I mentioned, but we have at least one participant in every one um, of the states. Um, and we even have some international participants as well, which is quite exciting. Just as a summary of how much information we've been able to gather over the last um, year or so, we have more than four and a half million daily symptom updates. We have more than 150,000 serology results. And that's most of what I'll focus on sort of the preliminary findings that we have right now. And then across all of the different sites, we have more than 17 million electronic health record data elements. And this includes a number of things. So demographic information, behavioral information like smoking and alcohol use, vaccine related information, um, and then general information about a primary care visit, an urgent care visit, um, a hospitalization. We capture medications, vitals and lab results, active problems and diagnoses, anything else that happens in the encounter or in an outpatient procedure. This is the distribution. So um, the gender distribution, you see all the way on the left, these are the uh, males and females participating in the study at large. So meaning the daily syndromic surveillance. But then we took a subset of those participants and asked them to participate in serology. And so you see there's a sampling strategy here. Um, you see the gender on the left and then age on the right. So we've oversampled different populations uh, to try to get some more information. And you see that most relevant here when we look at race and ethnicity. So the total bar is everyone that's in the study. The darker green shows uh, the sampling so for serology. So you'll see that we've oversampled for uh, minority populations on the left. Of all the things that I'm sharing today, I think this is the piece that um, I'm most excited about it and perhaps most proud of is the results of the serology testing in terms of participation. So this is MedStar data specific. Um, we have over 8,500 participants. And again, this is a monthly um, blood spot test. And we have almost 45,000 kits that have gone out. 
There's about a thousand people who received a kit. They said they wanted to participate, but never returned that first kit. Um, but outside of that, that means there's 7,500 people that have been doing this. Um, and more than 50% of those people are in at least their sixth kit or their seventh kit. Um, and that's pretty incredible community participation. So 78% of all the kits, more than 34,000 um, are representing people who have returned at least five kits. So you can imagine we're looking at anybody's over time, that continued participation is quite important. So I'll share with you some of the antibody results. What we did is conduct two different antibody tests in our study. We're trying to figure out if people are developing antibodies from natural infection um, or natural transmission or from vaccination. So um, essentially, you develop antibodies uh, about one to four weeks after infection or vaccination. And the spike protein antibody starts to rise if you've been infected with the virus. The nucleocapsid antibody will also rise, uh, but people who, and people who have been vaccinated, um, they won't have that nucleocapsid antibody. And we can see how long it takes for them to develop and how long it takes for them to decay. So based on these different tests, we're able to see how many people had a COVID vaccine, how long antibodies lasted after vaccination, whether someone who's been vaccinated can get infected. And we're looking at those breakthrough cases uh, with and without symptoms. How many people have been vaccinated um, get infected? How many people, um, how long antibodies last after detection and whether people with antibodies after infection can get affected, infected again for a second time. So this first results is focused on antibody development. How long does it take for antibodies to develop? The test on the left is the uroimmune. This is a research grade test. So it's much more sensitive. It's much, much more specific. Um, and you can see consistent with what guidance we're getting from the CDC, about two weeks after vaccination, you start to see those antibodies rise. This is looking at different age groups. And so it's taking longer for an older population generally to develop those antibodies. The test I'm showing you on the right is the Inavita lateral flow assay, and this is more commercial grade. So you might be wondering for a CDC funded research study, why are we using a test that's less, less sensitive and less specific? I think we really want to think more pragmatically about this. Um, if folks in the community are using this community level for these commercial level um, tests, are they getting the right results and how might that be impacting their behavior or the policy? So in this less sensitive test, we're seeing a similar trend. It's taking longer for older people to develop antibodies, uh, but we still see them around that two week period, um, but we're not detecting as many, again, because it's not as good of a quality of a test. Then we can look at zero prevalence. So zero conversion means you didn't have antibodies and then you do. On the left, we're looking at the national cohort. So the site's funded by the CDC. We didn't start doing this as early as we would have liked. So you would have expected to have seen more natural infection, but uh, that's just because we didn't have as many of those tests going out. But it is interesting to see when the vaccine was available, just how many people were vaccinated and you see just a tremendous uptake in antibody development. Another interesting piece here, looking just specifically at the North Carolina cohort, is the difference between non-healthcare workers and healthcare workers. So um, we see different levels um, here of that zero conversion. So pre-vaccine, lots of natural infection. Um, and then healthcare workers, we see a spike um, because they were one of the first in line to get the vaccine. So we saw more antibodies develop. Um, one of the things I think um, top of mind and, and in the media right now is antibody decay. And so we're looking at that as well. How long can we detect antibodies after infection? These graphs are showing not vaccine induced antibodies, but natural transmission. And so you're seeing on the left, this decay in antibodies. Um, and so for folks that had that natural transmission, we're seeing the antibodies um, start to go away after two or three months. Um, one other interesting finding, which is this graph on the right, is that the folks who had um, POSI or asymptomatic COVID, they didn't have as many symptoms, they weren't as sick. Those antibodies go away a whole lot faster than someone who had a higher severity case of COVID. So I wanna make sure I'm not contributing to misinformation here. These are quantitative, these are not quantitative tests. We're either detecting antibodies or we're not. Um, we're not calculating how many antibodies we're able to see, but it is interesting the body um, is just pretty amazing in terms of how it responds. So you might not have detectable levels of antibodies, uh, but because of your um, B cells and T cells, they might immediately engage and react when 
they meet the virus. Um, you might also have detectable antibodies um, and still have those breakthrough cases. So this is in no way you know, a perfect test to say whether or not you would get infected. We're also looking at symptoms, which has been really interesting. So 35% of folks that zero converted, they didn't have antibodies and then they did either from natural infection or from vaccine reported symptoms in that month prior to the test, the, the blood test that they had returned. Um, and so a lot of those um, symptomatic cases, and then you're seeing about 65% um, were asymptomatic or didn't report anything in their daily um, symptom reporting. We can also look at different clusters of symptoms. So you see on the right, folks that are presenting with congestion and loss of taste and smell or a headache, um, those are associated with having um, a positive antibody test. Um, and then you see things, combinations like diarrhea, shortness of breath, nausea, that those are less frequently associated um, with having developed antibodies. And the thicker the line, the stronger the association. Um, and so this has been interesting for us to look to see what are the symptoms that you would expect to see for a COVID case. Um, and then lastly, we're looking at um, symptoms reported amongst folks that had zero converted in the long term. And so again, really important right now to think about long COVID and the type of symptoms that folks are reporting. For here, you see a really significant amount of time. Time zero is when we have that zero conversion. So for the week before that, there are some symptoms, um, heavier symptoms in the first couple weeks um, of infection. And then we see some of them continuing 30, 40 um, weeks after having that infection. And these, this is natural infection, not just um, not the vaccine related. We're also able to deploy some supplemental surveys. So in that daily symptom reporting, we're able to sneak in a few of these other surveys to get more information from folks that are participating. So some interesting findings here. We released a survey around Thanksgiving and then another um, around the winter holidays. We had more than 20,000 respondents. Um, and not surprisingly, folks were gathering with people outside of their household some for Thanksgiving, even more around the holidays. Only 30 to 40% of those folks wore masks and less than one fifth of them were tested prior to gathering. You can see those um, you know, public health type behaviors in the top right. And then lastly, we looked at vaccine attitudes. Um, of course, we're interested in things like vaccine hesitancy. In one recently published report, this includes just um, folks from North Carolina cohort, more than 20,000. Um, and we did see hesitancy, vaccine hesitancy, noted in specific subgroups, specifically African-Americans, um, folks living in more suburban area, women and folks with prior infection. So again, thinking about um, some of the misinformation about protected immunity and that having infection protects you for a long amount of time, which we've demonstrated it doesn't. And the main concern being about safety and a lack of testing in the vaccine. We did follow those people over time. And so by May, we had seen most of them had been vaccinated, including more than 50% who initially expressed resistance. So ongoing and future activity, um, focused right now on breakthrough infections, of course, and variants of concern. So following Delta um, and looking at some of that virology to see how that spread um, across the country, especially trying to inform the need for boosters. So we'll continue these serology tests and be able to see some of that antibody decay. We're also looking at the EHR data. So like many other folks really interested in the long-term sequelae, the total burden of the pandemic on the healthcare system. Um, and then right now really focused on immunocompromised um, patients, what their experience has been, are they developing antibodies and are they um, experiencing any vaccine hesitancy? So um, thank you. This is you know, an army of people behind this work um, and it's really led by the community and their participation. So thank you for your time and happy to answer questions once all the speakers are done.